Joost Van Drunen, and uh, he is the managing director of Superdata Research, and he has over 15 years of experience in the industry. Prior to this, he held senior positions at Nielsen Online and DFC Intelligence. He's going to talk today about the shift from big box to digital uh, and how developers can get the most out of the new ecosystem. Thanks. Is this on? Everybody can hear me? All right, good morning. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, the economics of you know, living outside the box, which is a catchy way of saying um, what's going on with free to play, how is it different from retail, uh, how can we make the most of this, and really what's going on in the market. So it'll be both uh, an overview of the market as we see it in our analysis and data, as well as sharing some insights from some of the work that we do. Um, first things first. Uh, my name is Joost. I am Managing Director at Superdata, a um, company in New York. I'm also a professor at New York University on a class in video games, which is very fortunate and very lucky um, in that I get to essentially talk on a weekly basis with, you know, the sectioned off focus group all to myself, uh, you know, and ask actual gamers what they think of games uh, across the spectrum. Um, so that's kind of what I do uh, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. Um, the big part of that is uh, company Superdata. What we do, in a nutshell, is we track uh, consumer spending in online games. Uh, we track over 200 titles, uh, focusing mostly on MMOs and social. We also do virtual worlds and uh, first-person shooters and so on. Um, we do this to, you know, focusing on several of the key markets like Brazil, United States, Germany, France, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this allows us to essentially calculate benchmarks, right? So we can do month-to-month -month spending uh, per user, uh, conversion rates, uh, ARP DAO, ARP PPU. I'll be talking about some of these metrics uh, in this presentation. But essentially, uh, you know, it gives us a little bit of a sense, like, okay, what is, it, what is everybody doing in aggregate? Uh, we also use some of this uh, analysis uh, to basically figure out, uh, say, revenue estimates, market sizing, forecasts, et cetera. Um, and we have a lot of fun doing this. Uh, you know, our customer base uh, varies from anything to AAA developers and publishers to venture capital firms and Wall Street. Um, so that's a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions all at once for us, which we you know, enjoy uh, answering. So um, key point today is this, right? So free to play is here to stay. Um, if you had had this presentation 10 years ago, it would have been a lot more up in the air with regards to, um, you know, is this a viable model? Um, in the last year alone, uh, you see that the C-level people in a lot of the big box firms uh, are, are noticing that, you know what, actually, you know, free-to-play, virtual goods, microtransactions are all becoming viable s streams of revenue, right? Um, the data backs this up. Uh, when we compare, uh, say, unbox data to box data, um, we notice that the box data, the retail and the arcade uh, streams of revenue are actually, uh, you know, still predominantly uh, the largest ones. Um, so here we're looking at uh, U.S. spending. Uh, traditional boxed revenue uh, is on a decline of about 5% annually. I'm sure most of you know this. Uh, what's exciting, though, is that the unboxed revenue, so digital, subscription, and free-to-play, is not only uh, making up for that, uh, but it's also inc growing the market overall. So, you know, so guess what? The executives are right, huh? The data backs it up. Um, so really what we want to talk about uh, here for a few minutes today is, you know, what are the characteristics of the free-to-play market, right? So, so here we are uh, dealing with a traditional value chain of a retailer, distributor, hardware manufacturers, and so on, and all of a sudden we find ourselves in this online world. Um, you know, how does that differ? What are the, what are the characteristics of a market like this? And, and, and what should we be looking at when we, you know, make games, when we develop games, when we invest money in developing games, et cetera? Um, so the first real uh, thing that uh, I think drives a lot of the market trends and characteristics is the fact that it's a very, very accessible market. Um, I don't have to tell you the number of apps in the App Store. Everybody knows it's you know, something like 500,000 or whatever. It's really uh, a very accessible market, meaning uh, a large number of developers can get access to a large market, right? Um, secondly, it's also uh, a growing market. Um, you know, to put it one way, um, one of my colleagues at the NYU Game Center, he says that it's now the exception to not be a gamer, right? To not be playing games is the exception, um, which means that there's uh, now a much wider customer base. 
for everybody to appeal to. Uh, at the same time, uh, where uh, traditional console retail uh, used to be uh, the bread and butter in, say, developed markets and economies, uh, in emerging markets, there is no such thing, right? There's no real retail market in, say, Latin America uh, that, that, you know, on the same level as it is in the U.S. And so here you have this sort of leapfrog in technology where people are now coming online and they want to play something. And so all of a sudden markets open up in a way that they have never been before. Uh, and finally, and I think this is uh, perhaps the most exciting one uh, of the last couple of months, uh, I think Zynga going IPO, going public, uh, followed uh, with Facebook's IPO, um, not only uh, creates a lot of change and momentum in the market, but it validates the revenue model, right? So uh, I'm sure most of you have read, uh, Facebook relies up to 12% of its revenues on Zynga alone, which is a fantastic number if you consider the size of what's taking place. Um, so it works, it's here, but at the same time, it's not yet set in stone. So there's still a lot of moving parts and pieces, and there's a lot of opportunity to sort of make the most out of that. All right, so that's all very good news, right? So the, the tougher news, the challenges in the market is, uh, as it is accessible, so it becomes crowded. Um, you're now dealing with lots and lots of developers and studios all vying for the same audiences, all looking to kind of capture the same group of people. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to come up with something really unique. Uh, you see this occasionally, uh, and, and there's a lot of due diligence that goes behind this. Um, as the market becomes uh, very distributed equally and having lots and lots of small players, the larger ones will be looking to consolidate. So uh, again, Zynga, for instance, has uh, acquired, I think, 12 or 14 companies over the last year alone, recently bought four more mobile studios. Uh, they're really looking to hire the talent. They're really looking to acquire a footprint in a particular platform, in a particular niche, so that they have a stake in that, right? Um, that makes it so that over the long term, it would be very difficult to compete with one of the bigger ones. Let's see, the last one is lack of market transparency. Um, what that means in this case is sort of two-sided. Uh, on the one hand, you have the problem of discovery. Uh, so in a highly accessible market, there's lots of games available. So how, do your customer how does your customer base find out about your awesome game? Right, so that's kind of one side of the issue. Another side of the issue is um, if there's no insight into the market in general, how do I make decisions, right? So how do I know uh, what game to develop next? How do I let my, uh, how do I decide on what market to enter next and so on? So that's, so those are some of the challenges that we see in the market today. Um, and I guess uh, the best way to sort of underline this is to give you an example. Uh, traditionally you would say, well, you know, if you have great IP, uh, you have a great sort of existing brand, a game that people know and love, um, you throw $9.2 million in investment at it, trying to you know, go into mobile and social, that should work, right? Um, well, sort of, but not really. Uh, launching in January, um, Play First released Diner Dash on Facebook. Uh, within about six months, they had two and a half million installs, right? That's a big number for a lot of us, I think. By November, they shut the game down. Uh, uh, they did the same thing with Chocolatier, one of their other big franchises. So, you know, what does that kind of tell you? What does that indicate as a problem? Uh, for me, it kind of says, well, you know, you have to really go a little bit further than just IP and traffic to evaluate where your business is headed. I mean, if you're this big of a company, if you have this much, uh, you know, if you have this much money to develop this, you know, how do you make the most out of that? So, you know, it's unfortunate to see Flow on the go, but really the question is, you know, what are the economics, right? So, what is fundamentally different about the economics of living outside the box that is, uh, you know, compared to, say, retail? Uh, well, the dictionary tells us that economy means a careful management of available resources and wealth. Um, in other words, um, evaluation, right? You today, you live in a network of companies, uh, in an ecosystem in which everybody is constantly evaluating and assessing themselves and everybody else. Um, so as an example, let's say in traditional retail, uh, as a publisher, you would create the game and then you'd ship it off to say GameStop or Walmart and they deal with the customer. Uh, today, that's very different. You deal with the customer, right? So you have to deal with everybody in between you and the customer on a direct basis. Uh, this can be uh, anything from investors to ad networks to service providers and, and so on. 
and it's the uh, type of questions that you have to ask for each of these relationships that really matter. So for instance, as an investor, uh, let's say uh, I'm about to invest uh, a bunch of money in your game, or alternatively, I'm trying to get a second round of funding for my game. Um, what do I look at? Well, let's look at your performance in the market, right? How do I know that you are outperforming your comp competition, making it worth my while to actually spend some money? Let's see, traditional publishers, you know, this is, uh, I think it was Ben Cousins from, uh, who, from NG Moco last year who said that um, traditional publishers have in their DNA, you know, this sort of f uh, forecasting machinery. Um, if anything, uh, if you're dealing with any big publishers, that's what they do for a living, right? So they just look at numbers, they benchmark everything. They want to make sure that they get a return on their investment long term. Um, finally, the uh, advertisers and partners. So let's say I have a premium audience that outperforms the market. They are twice as engaged. They spend four times as much money. This is the type of information that you can use when dealing with ad networks, with service providers, et cetera. So, um, so you're evaluating constantly. So that's, that's sort of the name of the game, right? Um, most of you will be familiar with internal analytics. I'm, I have a bunch of people coming to my game. Uh, I convert uh, over time. Uh, so what we did here, and I'll be presenting a few slides uh, that are all geared towards the German market in this case. Um, in this case, we're looking at monthly conversion rates. So, imagine, so we took, we anonymized some of this, of course. Uh, we took one title here. As its install base grew, uh, its conversion rate goes down. Um, so what happens there is, of course, you might have a very profitable layer of customers that spend money, but as you, you know, have an increasing install base, your conversion rates will drop, right? Um, this is very deceptive. This might look like your game is kind of on the way out. If you then uh, aggregate all your, uh, your RPPU, for instance, so this is uh, a city building game. Uh, the bottom line here, the purple one, it doesn't really show much of anything. It kind of goes up, sort of, not very exciting. Same for the bottom 50, the middle 40. Uh, it's not too spectacular. However, if you look at the top 10 spenders, right, you see that it doubles over the course of a year. This is interesting information. There we go. This is an interesting information for me, right? So now I can see that not only did I uh, do well, I doubled my revenues over, over the course of a year. All right, so you're evaluating yourself um, internally. That's great, right? So that's a really good first step, and I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this part. Um, the next step, of course, is then evaluating yourself against the market. So let's say uh, in this scenario, uh, okay, so here I am at the same title. Um, this is the industry benchmark, right? So this is my market segment, and this is how they, they perform on an RPPU, I think. Is it RPPU? Yes, RPPU. And it sort of gives this impression that it's, uh, you know, on par with the market, a little bit above. Uh, okay, uh, that's great. However, you want to break this down into its components, right? So RPPU in and of itself doesn't tell you the whole, the whole story. So here we see, for instance, that engagement is much higher across the market. It's still in an upswing for this title, but the overall market is much higher, right? So uh, are your customers engaged as much as everybody else? Yes, no, why not? Uh, and following the transaction value, um, while the engagement might be uh, sort of in an upswing, what this shows is that you know, the overall industry, in fact, you know, people are starting to spend more from month to month, but, your partic but this particular title is on a decline. So let's say I'm an investor, you know, looking at the RPPU alone is not enough, right? I want to see it in comparison. And so uh, the traditional sort of market research uh, scenario here runs, uh, oh great, we had a sale, where a car company made a sale, and sales are up 10% because of this special that we ran. Everybody applaud for yourself, is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Okay, but what if the rest of the economy, you know, just took a huge jump and everybody else is up 50%, right? So you kind of want to see where you stand in your progression compared to everybody else. Um, next up is, uh, okay, you know, there's apples to apples or apples to oranges. Um, it does not really strike me as functional to say, well, I'm a city building game in Germany and I'm going to compare my traffic to all the traffic in the world and say, well, I have this percentage. Really, you want to look at you know people, uh, companies, and games and titles that are relevant to your efforts, right? So, uh, city building and in this case, uh, strategy and combat, they both show an upswing, which is great. You know, this is 
a strong market in general, and this, this looks very promising. However, uh, over time, uh, when, when looking at the average value per purchase, um, you find that uh, strategy and combat games are showing more of a U-shaped graph. Uh, in other words, they start off pretty strong, but then kind of soften across the year, and then finally regain some of its initial strength. Um, that's great, good for them. However, city building games, boom, it doubles over a year, right? So this is a very different trend line, and it helps you make decisions on, say, you know, what game do we develop next? What genre do we enter into? What, what, you know, how do we pull the trigger on a game or not? Um, then looking at engagement, so number of purchases on a monthly basis, uh, you see that this uh, is a little bit of a reverse story here. You say, well, this might be the case uh, that they spend more, but city building is actually, you know, the last six months of, the, of 2011 is a little bit on a decline in terms of engagement, right? So let's say, you know, I want to go get a second round of funding. Well, you know, here is a number of people that uh, are not as engaged as they used to. So what does that mean? How does that affect my relationship with my ad networks? How does it affect my relationships with my payment providers? Next question that generally comes up is, okay, in traditional retail, because there was no reasonable, bless you, reasonable uh, market that focused on consoles in, say, Brazil or Latin America in general, you know, there was never that question on the table saying, well, you know, let's develop something, localize it, and go into this other market. Instead, you know, in free-to-play, you do have that option, but you have to do your homework, so to say. So when looking at uh, engagement, so the number of purchases per month, you see immediately that uh, in Brazil, people spend four times as much, yeah, did I say that right? Four times as much as in Germany, right? So in other words, there is a greater volume, for every German purchase in a social game, there is four in Brazil. However, if you then uh, look at the value of those purchases, you see immediately that, well, the Germans spend a little bit more, right? So they outspend the Brazilians one to 10. So, you know, when thinking about, um, how do you say, allocating resources for your Brazilian adventure, you really want to make sure that you have the right revenue estimates and projections before you, you know, jump in the pool, so to say. Finally, um, then there's also sort of the larger service providers. Uh, so we looked at some of the data here just to compare sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, when picking uh, service providers, uh, say indirect payment providers, there's a, you know, a possibility to triple your revenue by making different decisions. Um, this directly affects your bottom line. Uh, I know that you know, sort of in the industry, you often see, well, we don't know what the difference is between all these people, all these companies. Uh, there seem to be a lot of them. How do we deal with this? Monitoring their behavior gives you a much stronger uh, set of, of, of benchmarks by, by which you can say, look, this is not working out for us, or you know what? We actually made a lot more money by changing our providers. Uh, so in this case, quickly, we just looked at uh, indirect payment providers, industry average of about 335, and you know, it can vary. There's a great variance between these two examples. Similarly, for mobile payment, um, mobile payment is uh, very expensive, as some of you will know. Um, okay, so let's get the most bang for our buck. When we're looking at uh, you know, picking different providers, you know, what can we expect, uh, and how much do we get to keep at the end of the day, and how does that affect our bottom line? Um, so finally, uh, we're sort of at the end now, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a case study of uh, a customer that we work with um, that question was, well, look, we're going in for another round of funding. We want to know, you know, how we stack up. Like, how do we, how do we, kn uh, you know, where do we stand and what do we say to our potential investors? Um, the key to all this or the sort of takeaway of this one particular table is um, you have to look at this at uh, more than one particular variable, right? So in other words, you know, while their conversion rate is slightly under their category benchmark, um, their, you know, their, uh, what is it, uh, sessions length is greater, right? So there's different ways to evaluate your company, your game, your genres, and your portfolio um, that will allow you to give you a much better, you know, 360 pr perspective on, you know, how you perform and, and, and what the company is worth. Uh, sure, there are some weaknesses on the table here. Uh, there's a couple of numbers that are substantially lower, but, you know, there is, there is something that salvages a little bit. So here's a conversation that you could have saying, well, we want to have some investment money because we want to fortify some of our efforts in these areas. Um, so for this particular uh, company, we also looked at 
um, how they perform in particular audience segments. So we sliced it down by geography and by you know, target groups. In their case, they did really well uh, with uh, those segments of the market that uh, generally spend more. So you know, these, these are some redeeming qualities of a game that may initially not show to be very strong, but then you know, does have a few very, very interesting and sort of uh, worthwhile aspects to it. So um, with that, I'll just conclude it uh, saying, you know, what's so new about the economics of free to play uh, and, and living in this unboxed world is that uh, you now have this responsibility as a game company, as a publisher, um, to really you know, do your homework, right? So it's not just the internal analytics. Uh, you want to look at the larger market. You want to be able to say, okay, well, here's a, a universe and an ecosystem in which everybody evaluates everybody else, uh, so, so should we. Um, and it's because it's so accessible, uh, there's a lot of things to look at. Um, so we expect um, for the next couple of years, you know, the, the, the sort of habit of, you know, really what normal companies have been doing for, for years, for game companies, especially in the online space, to start evaluating themselves against the market. Um, I think uh, on, a, on a final note, it's what's exciting for me about this market is that you know, here's this traditional monolithic uh, boxed industry, and here we are sort of trying to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis, like what does it mean to live in this, in this new space, in this new world? Um, there is no manual to any of this, right? So we're really just writing the book as we go along. Um, you see that other media industries are looking over our shoulders, trying to figure out what it is that we found and uh, what we're doing with this. And so there's a real sort of leadership opportunity as an industry to really blow this out of the water. Um, so as a final note, I would say, you know, keep evaluating, keep looking, and keep holding yourself accountable for what you do and what you put out in the market. Uh, that concludes my slides. If there's any questions, I'll be here for a bit. Thank you.